Well, it is good to have you here at Sunday School, and uh, Brother Colton's going to come here in a moment and uh, teach our lesson this morning, what the Lord's laid upon his heart, but I just wanted to bring to your attention that the Thames are grandparents again, but this time it is a grandson. Glenn, are you excited about that? Yeah. And so they have pictures if you'd like to see them, many of them. Uh, they've already shared, I think, five or six with me, so via the cell phone, but I know they're excited. Mom and baby are doing well, and Daddy's doing well, too, so pray for them. Pray for many that are, heavy, that are just struggling with COVID, so pray that uh, they would uh, get better. And you go, and Reggie Black told me today his dad was uh, tested positive for He's been going to therapy, uh, and he got it while he was at therapy, so pray for him. And just many, pray for Gerald. He's got a, we got a doctor's appointment coming up for him. And uh, pray that the Lord would give wisdom on uh, some, what to do for him. And again, we're thankful for God's goodness. Amen. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? We can trust him. My question today is, are you trusting him? Are you trusting him? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to be together this morning. I pray that your, your Holy Spirit would have freedom to work in and through us, Lord, that we would not be concerned of the, the cares of the world today, Lord, but we could be concer concerned of the cares of um, things to come, Lord, and, and heaven and the word. And Lord, help us to be obedient to the spirit. Pray be with uh, Pastor Colton as he opens the word now. And we thank you for bringing he and his wife here. We're excited about the um, having them part of the staff. And I pray that you'd bless this time. We commit it to you. I pray be with all those that are uh, struggling today with di different ailments and getting over COVID. Some that are going through the throes of it right now and upcoming surgeries for some, procedures for some. I pray that you would just guide and direct in all those things. Father, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to Sunday School. Uh, like you said, Pastor Goforth is out of town right now um, at his son-in-law Austin's ordination, and so he asked me to help cover Sunday School, and today what I want us to talk about is the subject of discipleship. I know for the past several weeks, uh, Pastor Goforth has been teaching a lot on discipleship and what it means uh, for the local church to be doing the, the business and, and the fulfilling the role of discipleship and how that's really the central purpose of the church to reach people to share the gospel and to disciple them to become followers of Christ as well and so today what I want to do is just take a few minutes and go through something really practical that could help us to learn how we can become disciples of Christ who make more disciples uh, this past semester uh, when I was in school one of my teachers showed me this this tool and it's a really simple a tool to help us and think through what it means for us to become disciples who make disciples. So as you were coming in, you should have seen on the, the welcome counter a blank sheet of paper. Is there anyone who uh, did not grab one of those blank sheets of paper? Go ahead and raise your hand. And could we get, I don't know if we have any ushers here, if we could get maybe just a few volunteers, someone who could go grab those from the back and help pass them out to the few people who uh, don't have one yet. All right, just go ahead and keep your hands up and they'll bring those sheets of paper in. So what you're gonna get is just a blank sheet of paper. And what I love about uh, this tool is that it's so simple that all you need to learn this and to do this is a blank sheet of paper, a pen, and a Bible. It's very simple. And what, what I really love about this is that once you learn it, you can easily do it yourself and show someone else how they can also begin to think about discipleship and think about how they can begin reaching people uh, in there. Uh, life and in their sphere of influence and begin to disciple them. So if you had that sheet of paper, go ahead and take it and you're going to fold it in half just like this. All right, and as you're getting your papers and folding them in half, uh, let me turn your attention to a couple passages real quick before we get started. In Matthew 28, this is a very familiar passage to all of us. It's the Great Commission. This is the last command that Christ gave to his disciples. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now in that passage, Christ gives a list of commands. But there's only one command in there that's actually an imperative, that actually is a command. All the others are just descriptions of that one command. And the main 
imperative verb, the main command he gives in that passage is in verse 19, where he says to teach all nations. Now that word teach in the Greek comes from the same exact word as disciple. It's just the verb form of disciple, the imperative verb form. And what it's saying is to go and make disciples of all nations, to go and reach people from all nations and disciple them to be followers of Christ. And right after that, when it says all nations, uh, what do you think of when you hear the word nations? I know for me, when I think of nations, I picture a map where there are continents and there's lines drawn around plots of land, and a nation is that local place within those political borders. That's a nation. So when I think of Christ saying, go and reach all nations, I think we need to go overseas to another place, another location within some political boundary, and we have to go there to reach people, to disciple other nations. But the word nations isn't talking about anything political. It's not talking about boundaries or location. The word nation simply means ethnicity or people group. In fact, the word behind the word nations there is ethnos, where we get our word ethnicity from. And the really interesting thing is that you and I don't have to necessarily go overseas to another location to share the gospel and make disciples of other nations. You and I can reach people of other nations, even here in Colombia. Over the last several years, all across the U.S., we've seen a huge growth of, of immigrants and people coming from other countries to the major cities of the U.S. And we have a tremendous opportunity to seek out and reach people from other nations, even in our own neighborhood. So, uh, just, just when you read that verse and you think of that verse and Christ's command to disciple all nations, uh, don't think that the only way you can fulfill that is by becoming a missionary. Although that is, that is one very important way to fulfill the great, the great Commission. But you can also obey Christ's command while you're here in West Columbia or in Lexington or in Casey or in Columbia. This area we have opportunities to reach people of other nations. And let's look at one more passage, Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. In Matthew 4, 19, this is when Jesus first called uh, his first few disciples. I'm sure you know this story. He went to the Sea of Galilee. Peter and some of the others were fishing. And Jesus called out to them. And he said unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. From the very moment he called his disciples to the moment he left them in Matthew 28, the main emphasis that Christ was trying to get across to his followers is that their purpose as his disciples, their purpose as his followers, was to be disciples who make disciples. They were followers who were to fish, who were to go and reach and disciple others to follow Christ. So how can we do that? How can you and I become disciples of Christ who make more disciples? Well, to do that, we're going to take your sheet of paper. And on the very front page, I want you to, uh, to write this. So anything you see on the slide... You're going to copy and just use the pen, maybe in your pew, or if you have a pen on you, use that and just copy it on this sheet of paper so that you can keep this and use this as a reference later. So on the very first page, you're going to write at the top left corner, number one, and we're going to ask the question, why? Or why should you and I make disciples? And then if you open up your book after writing that, you're going to write on the second page, who? And here we're going to answer, who is it in our life? that God has given us an opportunity to reach with the gospel. Who is it that we can disciple? And then on the next page over, the third page, we're going to write the question, what? In other words, what are we going to say when we come into contact with those people that God has placed into our life? What will we say when we try to share the gospel with them? So why, who, what? And on the back, you're going to write when. And at the very end today, what we're going to do is just set a few very simple goals that you can, you can set for yourself in planning how you can live this out, in planning when you can live this out and reach others with the gospel. So why, I'll just go over this one more time, why on the first page, who, what, and then when. All right, so let's start with the first page, the why. Why? Why should you and I make disciples? Well, first of all, like we just saw in Matthew 28, Christ commanded it, right? So when Christ commands us to do something, we should obey his commandment. We should obey his great commission simply because he commanded us to do it. But not only should we be doing discipleship because it's a commandment that we are to obey, but what scripture actually teaches us too is that making disciples is part of who we are. 
is part of who Christ has made us to be. It's part of your identity. So again, whatever you see up here, just go ahead and copy on your sheet. So why should we make disciples? Because it's part of who we are. It's part of our identity. And let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. That passage says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Right in the middle of that passage, in verse 19, the, the central truth that Paul is teaching the church in Corinth is that God in Christ reconciles us to himself. That is what Christ came here to do. He came to reconcile you and I to the Father. Try to get that slide up there. There we go. All right, so go ahead and just write across, right in the middle of that. And that's going to represent Christ's role of reconciling us to the Father. And then if you look in verse 17, if you look in verse 17, Paul also describes, he uses two terms to describe what we become when we are reconciled to Christ. And the first word he uses is the word new. He says in verse 17, he has made us a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And what that means is that for those of us who come to Christ, Whatever we did before we knew Christ, whatever someone did to us before, none of that stuff defines who we are anymore. When we come to Christ, our slate is wiped clean, and we are brand new creations in Christ. And then on the next slide, in verse 20, this passage also tells us that not, not only are we made new when we're reconciled to Christ, but we are also made ambassadors for Christ. So those of us who have been reconciled to Christ, we've also been, as this passage describes, we've been committed, or the, the ministry of reconciliation has been committed to us. The word of reconciliation has been given to us. So those of us who are in Christ, who have been reconciled to God through the Son, we are made new, but we are also ambassadors. Part of our role as disciples is to be the representatives of Christ who go to those who don't know him and share the gospel. All right, and then next we're going to turn to the uh, second question, and that is who? Who should we be discipling? Who is it that God has placed in our life that we have an opportunity to share the gospel with? All right, and to answer that question, we're going to use a really interesting tool uh, that I was shown, and this is what's called an oikos map. And the word oikos is from the Greek, and it simply means household. You can think of a household or community. This is, is people within your life, people that you know, relationships that you have. Uh, and one way we can think of this is it's simply your sphere of influence. These are the people that are within your life that you have relationships with, that you have opportunities to talk to, to share the gospel with. And so to, to fill this out, I want you to write your name right in the middle of the page and draw a circle around it. And then what I want you to do is we're going to take just a few seconds or a few minutes and I want you to pray about and ask the Holy Spirit to bring to mind at least one person, maybe two people, three people, uh, anyone in your life that you believe does not know Christ. These are people that are far from the Lord, but are near to you. They could be friends, could be family members, uh, could be co-workers or classmates. Um, it, it could be your barber that you go to every two weeks. It could be uh, the person at the grocery store behind the cash register that you uh, come into contact with uh, weekly or bi-weekly whenever you do your grocery shopping. So just take a few minutes and you can pray and ask 
ask the Lord just to bring to mind at least, at least one person in your life, within your sphere of influence, that you believe does not yet know Christ. So we'll take a few minutes, and I'll let you think about that and pray about that. And uh, go ahead and write one name next to your name. And if you could think of a few more, you can add as many names as you would like to this slide. And go ahead and, again, draw a circle around their name and try to connect it to your name right there in the middle. And this is going to help you just to map out and think of people in your life, again, that, that God has placed within your sphere of influence who do not know Christ. And now what we're going to do is let's look at two passages that are going to teach us something really interesting. I love this. When I was shown this, I thought it was really amazing. Let's look at John 17 verse 20, and then we're going to look at 2 Timothy 2, 2, and it's going to teach us something about discipleship. In John 17, this is Christ's high priestly prayer. It's shortly before he went to the cross, and he's in the garden praying, and he's praying for his disciples. But then in verse 20, he says this. He says, neither pray I for these alone, his disciples there, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. He prayed not only for his disciples, but he was praying for those his disciples were going to disciple. And then in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, Paul is speaking to Timothy here. He says, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And what these two passages show us is that discipleship is not just a one-on-one -on -one thing. It's not just about who can I reach, but that even both Christ and the Apostle Paul were thinking of discipleship generationally. They were thinking of not only the people that they were able to reach, but they realized that the people they could reach and the people they could disciple could also go and reach people that they would never have an opportunity to reach. See, when Christ prayed, he knew that shortly after he was going to be crucified, he was going to rise again and ascend to the Father, and his time on earth here in the flesh was going to end. And he wasn't going to have opportunities to personally reach and disciple more, so he prayed for the ones that his disciples would be able to reach that he couldn't reach. And just to help us think through that, let's, let's say you have a neighbor named Phil. And Phil has a daughter named Tracy who's away at college. And there's no way that you would probably ever come into contact with her and have a chance to share the gospel with her. But if you pray for and you share the gospel with Phil, then Tracy has a better opportunity of hearing the gospel from her father. And not only that, let's say Tracy, she goes to school, let's say she goes to the University of South Carolina, and she has two friends in her class named Jason and Anna. And those are people that you definitely wouldn't have come into contact with, people you would have never known about. But yet because Phil was reached, and because he was, let's say, able to reach his daughter Tracy, and she began to pray, Lord, who have you placed in my life that I can share the gospel with? Who have you placed in my life that I can disciple? She can reach her friends Jason and Anna, all because you prayed and asked the Lord and began to share the gospel with one person in your sphere of influence. See, discipleship is not just about adding people to the church. It's not just about you reaching others and adding them, but when we disciple others to disciple others, the church can multiply. And we can see many people come to know Christ that we, again, would have never even come into contact with. So we've answered the questions, why should we make disciples? Who should we reach? And now let's go to the third page. We're gonna answer the question of what should we say when we meet these people. And to, to answer this question, we're going to use two uh, simple tools that will help us to think through how we can share the gospel with them. Uh, the first one is what's known as a 15-second testimony. And this is just a tool that you can use if you're having a conversation with someone to help transition into sharing the gospel with them. 
And I know for those of us who have grown up in church, who have been in church for years, we probably have a lot of other tools that we've had memorized, such as the Romans Road or, or maybe uh, certain tracks that we have. And if you had those, you can use those. Uh, you can use whatever tool you have to share the gospel. But maybe for those of you who don't have uh, these different tools memorized or you still struggle with sharing the gospel, here's just two ways that you can begin thinking about how you can uh, begin reaching others with the gospel. So let's, use the, let's go through the 15 second testimony. And to do this, what you're going to write is that there was a time in my life when, and just put two blanks, and think of two words that describe your life before you came to know Christ. Maybe you were saved at the age of four, and you're like, I don't even remember what my life was like before Christ. Just think of two words that you know were true about you. You could say, I was lost in sin, um, I had no hope of eternal life, something like that. Just use two simple words. For instance, for my 15-second testimony, I've used the words guilt and uncertain. And what I meant by that was before, or when there, there was a time in my life when I was weighed down by the guilt of my sins and uncertain of what would happen to me when I died. So I use the words guilt and uncertain. Go ahead and think of two words that personally describe uh, your life before you came to know Christ. And then when you're finished with that, we're going to write right next to it. Just draw a cross and put two more blanks underneath and use these two blanks to think of two words that describe when you got saved. Uh, for me, I put received and changed. So I would say there was a time in my life when I was weighed down by the guilt of my sins and, and uncertain of what would happen to me when I died. But when I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, He changed my life forever. So I had the words received and changed. And again, go ahead and think of two words that describe your testimony. And then after that, we're going to put two more blanks and write that now my life is filled with, and again, think of two words that describe the change that Christ has worked in your life. Think of what your life is like now that you know Christ as your personal Savior. And I, as an example, I put the words joy and confidence. So I would say that now my life is filled with joy and confidence that I will spend eternity with God. So when you're finished, your testimony uh, should sound something like this. Again, and you'll use your own words to, to describe your personal testimony. But for me, what I have is there was a time in my life when I was weighed down by the guilt of my sins and uncertain of what would happen to me when I died. But when I received Christ as my personal Savior, He completely changed my life. So that now, my life is filled with joy and confidence that I will spend eternity with Him. And at the very end, you're going to turn it around and ask them, do you have a story like that? Or you could say, what about you? Have you had this kind of experience before? A couple weeks ago, um, the Lord gave me an opportunity to use this tool to begin sharing the gospel with someone. Uh, before we moved down here, we lived up in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, my wife and I were helping serve in this ministry where they would reach out to uh, refugee families and specifically reach out to their kids who some of them were older and never got their high school degree and couldn't get into college. And so they would help to mentor them and so that they could get their GED um, and begin uh, looking into colleges and things like that. And they used that as a tool to try to reach these families and have opportunities to share the gospel with them. And so I had an opportunity to mentor a young man who was from Africa. Uh, he was in his early 20s and never got his high school degree. And uh, one day I was going to go meet him at a, a tropical smoothie over by his house and just begin helping him fill out some applications and things for different classes he wanted to do. And before I went, I started to pray and ask the Lord to give me an opportunity to share the gospel with him. I didn't know a whole lot about his background, uh, but I, I wanted to have an opportunity to see if he knew Christ and to share the gospel with him if he didn't. And I had recently been shown a lot of these tools, so I was like, I'm going to go ahead and try uh, some of these, these things that I'm being taught. So when I got there to the tropical smoothie, I saw him walking in the door, and he had on a shirt. I don't remember what exactly it said, but it said something about the Lord. It said something about God, or I believe in God, or, or something. I don't remember specifically what it said, but when he came in, I asked him, oh, I asked him, oh that's, a, that's a nice shirt. Where'd you get that, or why'd you get that shirt? And he said, oh, I just got it because it's green, and that's my favorite color. 
And I, and I said, oh, okay, well, that's pretty interesting. So do you believe in God or do you go to church or anything like that? And he said, well, I grew up in a Catholic church and come to find out he uh, was an altar boy in a Catholic church in Africa. But since moving to the U.S., he uh, hadn't really been in church or anything like that. And so his family was religious. They were from a Catholic background. And um, when I began asking him about his life and, and his background and things like that, he then at the end asked me, oh, so what about you? And I said, well, you know, I grew up in church too, but I didn't grow up in a Catholic church. I grew up in a Baptist church. And I said, but even though I grew up in a church and, and my parents were Christians, my family, they were all Christians, I grew up in that environment, but I myself wasn't a Christian. And I said, so there was a time in my life when, and began to share my 15 second testimony. And that week, I didn't have a chance to go further into the gospel with them, but about a week or two later, I was praying about it again. I asked the Lord to give me another opportunity. And that next time I met with him, I got to go through the gospel completely with him. And he didn't make a decision or anything that day, but, uh, but the Lord used these tools that I'm going to show you today to help me to share the gospel with him. And so my hope is that you can also take this and uh, use it as a way to reach others with the gospel. So that's your 15-second testimony. And it's an amazing tool just to use to help you, you turn conversations toward Christ uh, whenever you meet with these people in your sphere of influence. And then the second tool we're going to go through is known as the three circles. And this is just another way to share the gospel. Again, there, there are many different ways you can, you can do this. You can use other tools and things as well. But this is just a simple way that I was shown. And what you're going to do, I'm just going to put it all up at once on the slide. You're going to copy all that on your sheet of paper. we got three circles with the arrows pointing between them. And on that second circle, you'll see those little squiggly lines with the arrows. Go ahead and draw all of that right there. And I'll give you just a minute to do that. And then we'll start filling it all out. And this is a way that maybe you're meeting with someone at a restaurant or in their home. And if you could just grab a piece of paper, you could draw this out and show them the plan of salvation. You could show them uh, the story of the gospel right there. So in the first circle, the top left corner, we're going to start there. I'll just go through it and we'll change the slides. And as you see things pop up there, just go ahead and copy that onto your sheet of paper. So this is how to share the gospel with three circles. When God created the entire world, when God created the universe, everything he created was perfectly good. God created us to have a relationship with him. God created us to live in a perfect world where there was no sin, where there were no problems, there, were no, there was no brokenness in the world. And everything God created was perfect and good. But there's a problem. And that is that you and I have sinned against God. The perfect order that he had created in this world, we broke that order and decided to, to establish our own ways of doing things and to make ourselves like we were God, deciding what was right and wrong. And we sinned against him. And because we've sinned against him, this world is no longer perfect the way that God created it. But instead, there's brokenness in this world. There's sin in this world. The consequences of our sin is a broken world. And each of us try to find different ways to escape this broken world. And that's what those little squiggly lines with the arrow represent. And you can draw little symbols of different things that, that would represent how you've tried to save yourself from the consequences of your sin. You could put money, you could put relationships, you, anything. But the point is that you and I try to find ways to escape the brokenness in this world. But what happens is, just like a bungee cord, we try to escape with those things, but all they do is snap us right back and bring us right back into the brokenness that we've created because of our sin. And because you and I cannot on our own escape the brokenness from our sins, Jesus Christ came to this world. He died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the grave three days later, defeating death, defeating the ultimate consequence of sin, so that he could save us from the brokenness that we have created. So that if we just turn from our sins and believe in Jesus Christ, believe in him as our Lord and Savior, he will restore us to the good fellowship and the good creation that God originally intended. We can have a relationship with God again that was once severed because of our sins. And one day you and I will be resurrected with him and live in God's renewed creation in perfect fellowship and in perfect harmony. 
And, and that right there is the three circles. It's just one simple way that you can use in sharing the gospel with someone uh, whenever God gives you the opportunity. And then last, we're just really quickly going to, on the back page, answer the question of when will you and I put these things into practice? When can we share the gospel? When can we disciple others to follow Christ? And so three simple goals that we can set. First of all, when will you pray? Think of the people in your sphere of influence that you've drawn on your Oikos map. And begin to think of a set time that you can set aside and pray for them regularly that God would give you opportunity or that God would already begin working in their hearts so that you can share the gospel with them. It could be 6 a.m. every day. You could put Tuesdays at 8 a.m. Uh, just whatever time you would like to set, set that side a time or set, set that time aside and pray for those people within your sphere of influence. So when are you going to pray? And then second of all, when can you show them that you care? I'm sure many of you have heard the statement that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you, what? Care, right? And you know, when Christ came to this world and, and brought salvation to people, he didn't just preach to them the message of the good news, but he also showed kindness to them. He showed love to them. He showed them that he cared for them. So think of ways that you can begin showing kindness and showing care for those people within your sphere of influence. It doesn't have to be anything big. It can be something as simple as just praying for them. Maybe you meet one of them and you say, hey, is there something I could pray for you about? Is there something in your life right now that you really need God to work in? Because I'd love to pray for you. Or maybe it's a neighbor and you bake cookies and bring it over to them just to show them, you know, that you care for them. Think of just one simple way that you can show them that you care for them. And then the last goal that we're going to set is when are we going to share? And go ahead and put a name and a time and say, you know what, I'm going to set a goal to share the gospel with this person in my sphere of influence, in my oikos map, this is a person that I'm going to on this day. Maybe it's, it's someone that you know you routinely see on a certain day of the week. Or maybe it's someone you see every day at work or at school. And just set a goal of when you are going to share the gospel with them. And again, go back and begin praying and asking the Lord to give you that opportunity. And so uh, today, what I, if you had some trouble thinking of someone to put uh, on your Oikos map there, on your, in your sphere of influence, and you're having a hard time thinking of someone that you know who doesn't know Christ, just take some time this afternoon before you take your Sunday afternoon nap or before you come back to church this evening and just pray about it. And ask God to bring to mind somebody that you know who does not know Christ. And if you're still struggling with, with thinking of someone, uh, maybe that's a sign that you're not branching out and you're not getting to know people outside of the church who don't know Christ. Uh, you know, I grew up in church. I grew up in a Christian home. I went to the Christian school at the church and my family basically lived at the church. We were at the church far more than we were ever at our own home. And, and I know from experience that living that way and growing up that way, it can be hard to get to know people outside of the church. And we be, can become so inward focused with all the programs and the games and the things that are going on in the church that we forget that our purpose is not just to make sure everything inside the church runs smoothly, but our purpose is really to be reaching out to people outside the church and finding ways to share the gospel with them, finding ways to bring them to Christ and to disciple them and to help them to become disciples who also make more disciples. So if you're struggling with thinking of a name, Think of ways that you could begin branching out and meeting people outside of your normal sphere of influence, people who do not know Christ, that you can make an opportunity to share the gospel with. All right, so now that you have this sheet of paper, you can keep this as a reference, you can keep this and go back and look at it, and maybe one of these people on your map, you'll have an opportunity to share the gospel with, and you will reach. And then what you can do is take them through this as well, and show them how they can begin thinking of how they can disciple other people. All right, so let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we will be dismissed until the service. Father, I thank you for this time that uh, we have just to look into your word, to look into um, the main responsibility you've given us as a church, to make disciples 
I ask that you would help each and every one of us in this room to think of people in our life, people who you have placed within our sphere of influence that you want us to reach out and share the gospel with. Lord, I pray that each and every person in this room uh, would think of at least one person and set goals for at least that one person to try to pray for them, to care for them, and to share the gospel with them. Lord, we ask that everything we do would bring honor to your name. In Jesus' name, amen.